Laurie, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of Plugged In, and also introduce you to my fabulous co-host, Daniel and Emro. Welcome back. Hello. Plugged In is a talk show that's all about your health, and specifically the health of your kidneys. This includes how to keep your kidneys healthy, learning more about kidney disease, which is often dubbed the silent killer, and the importance of organ donation and transplantation, and so much more. Plugged In is where you will meet many people living with kidney disease and hear about their struggles and triumphs. You will also meet those waiting for life-saving transplants and the heroes who have saved lives by donating one of their kidneys. Mm. And we also have some lighter segments today in the news because laughter is good for the health, right guys? Yes. <laughs> I, I agree. You know what, one of my favorite segments on Plugged In is the Did You Know segment. For oh example, did you know <laughs> that your nose can remember 50,000 different sets? You're hilarious. <laughs> I did not know that, Daniel. The nose, then. <laughs> the nose. No, you know, for, for sharing, nose. you know, crazy facts, uh, I read that the brain uh, stops growing at age 18. And then forward on from that, you lose 1,000 brain cells a day. That explains a few things, yeah. doesn't it? Also, in the news, I have a story of related chronic kidney disease related to death that's on the rise. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. And I can't wait for you all to meet our guests on today's Kidney Kids. We have in studio four talented young ladies who are part of the Kidney Kids crew who have been traveling around British Columbia and the Yukon spreading awareness about how kidney disease affects children. Very important. I love the Kidney Kids yeah. section. So, so sweet. So stay with us and we've got a great show lined up for you as always and stay tuned here on Plug In. On an international front now, deaths from chronic kidney disease are increasing among both women and men all over the world. According to a recent Global Burden of Disease study published in The Lancet, mortality due to the disease rose between 2005 and 2015 by 32% to 1 to 2 million deaths worldwide. The International Society of Nephrology's World Congress in Mexico City in April 2017 will focus on diabetes and kidney disease, major contributors to chronic kidney disease. In 2015, Latin America had the highest CKD rates in the world. In Mexico, more than half of patients who developed kidney failure did so by the result of diabetes. Once CKD has advanced to a complete kidney failure, the only options for prolonging life are long-term dialysis or kidney transplantation, complex and costly interventions which can not be accessible to general populations in most countries. Health experts say in order to stop this increase in CKD deaths, further research is urgently needed to identify and deliver low-cost strategies for prevention, early detection, and treatment. Canadian Blood Services, in partnership with the Organ Donation and Transplant Network, released the Systems Progress Report for 2006 to 2015. In it includes current Canadian statistics on deceased living donors and transplantation performance. Released in September, here are a few interesting facts. BC had the highest rate of living donors at 27 per million population. Canada, two years ago, set a target to meet 22 per million population. We currently sit at 18.2, with Spain at number one with 40 and the United States at 27. We're close to Australia, who have 18, and the UK, who have 20. There are currently 4,600 Canadians still waiting on an organ transplant. For more information on this report, go to kidney.ca. It is a known fact that people with an ethnic background, which includes Asian, South Asian, Aboriginal, or African, are at a higher risk of developing kidney disease. This hit close to home for the Nahaney family when Delia Nahaney donated her kidney to her daughter Marissa five years ago. Wanting to create awareness and bring hope to Indigenous people, the Nahaney family, in partnership with the Kidney Foundation, are inspired to host the inaugural gala, The Inspiration of Hope, in North Vancouver. Kidney BCY TV was there to capture this magical event. Hello, my name is Marissa Nahini. I come from the Squamish and Niscot peoples. And I, come, I live in North Vancouver. I'm also from up north um, in Gitwansilk. And my, my clan is Eagle. Tonight is the Inspiration of Hope. And it is a 
partnership with my family, the Nahaney family. My father, Latash, Maurice Nahaney, my mom, Dalgamha, Delia Nahaney, and myself, and the Kidney Foundation of Canada, BC branch. Tonight, we are looking forward to raising funds to help raise awareness and also to gain more money for research in Indigenous health for kidneys. In 2009, I was diagnosed with acute kidney failure, which later on developed into full kidney failure in 2010. And I was on dialysis for a year and a half. And then my amazing mom donated her kidney to me. And that was back in 2011. So it's been five years of successfully living with a kidney. And what tonight means to me is that if we could get the word out there about kidney disease and that uh, early detection and maybe help prevent anyone with a fate that I had. There's not a lot of awareness in the Indigenous world about kidney health and early detection. Also, to raise awareness about kidney donation, there's a lot of um, fears with kidney donation and if a lot more people learned that um, by giving a second chance of life, like my mother did, is that it transforms a life. Um, it's important for people to know about organ donations. A 23-year diet study done by the American Journal of Kidney Disease confirms that what is good for the heart is also good for the kidney. 1,500 middle-aged men and women have taken part in this study and the analysis shows that a heart-healthy diet is also beneficial to the kidney. The Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension or DASH diet is recommended for hypertension treatment or cardiovascular disease prevention. This diet is chock full in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and legumes, and low fat dairy products with low red and processed meats, sugar sweetened beverages, and sodium. For more information on this report, visit the American National Kidney Foundation at kidney.org. This next story is part of our special series on living kidney donors. In our last two segments, we introduced you to kidney donor Lieutenant Charles Mulder with Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services and his retired boss and transplant recipient, Chief Wayne O'Dean, just days before their transplant surgery. Today, Kidney BCY TV's Deborah Tucker takes you back into the home of kidney donor Lieutenant Charles Mulder and his family, just days after his surgery to see how they're all doing. Charles, Hi. you look great. Thank you. How are you feeling? I feel good. Oh, wow. Come on in. What Thank else? you. Let me take you back to that morning of surgery, that very early morning, mm -hmm. 11 days ago. What were you thinking just moments before they, they took you into the operating room? What was going through your head at that time? I don't think much. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, there was no need to think about much. They're, I was very well taken care of there. It was over very quickly. The drive-in... Uh, how, how quick was it? How long were you in surgery? Uh, I think I was out five and a half hours in total, but surgery time I think was three and a half hours. Um, it's just a blur. You don't. I remember coming to and wondering what time it is, and then someone told me it was three thirty in the afternoon, and I was like, "That was me." Was it? Sorry. <laughs> um, it was like I didn't even know what happened. Yeah. So in that respect, it was it was just a big blur. But uh, yeah, very well taken care of. I found. All the nurses and staff there were excellent. Heather, how did you feel when your husband told you that he was going to donate one of his kidneys to a colleague? At first I wasn't, I don't know if I wasn't happy, I was just kind of a bit shocked at first because we hadn't really talked about it beforehand. But knowing Charles, it was something he was going to do. So we talked about it and yeah, he we were all on board. And were, were you nervous? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, because he's never been through any major surgery before. I was also worried about what would happen to him after if he didn't get to do the same things that he always did. What, what surprised you? Did, you? did you know much about organ donation before? It's yeah. all new to me, but it was, it's been a very interesting journey through the whole thing. 
um, a lot of research and looking on the computer or in books or the pamphlets that the Kidney Foundation has and been going through all of it. How would you describe Charles as a person? He's very caring, he's outgoing, uh, he loves deeply with his family, I know that, he's very much into family and he really, he looks after his friends, he really does care for the people around him. So. And now you can add the word heroic to that list. We can add heroic to that list. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. So many people would describe what your dad did donating a kidney to another person who needed a life-saving kidney transplant is truly heroic. Do you think your dad would describe himself as a hero? I don't know if he sees himself as a hero, but definitely everyone sees him as a hero because this is just something he does daily. He's always a hero, being a fireman and saving people's lives every day, and what he does in his daily life, he is just a true hero. Yeah, for us, we definitely see him as a hero. I don't know if he necessarily sees himself as a hero. It's just Charles, like, that's what Charles does. He helps people in everything he does. He's always helping someone. So for him to be able to do this is like, it's just a Charles thing. Like even now, he shouldn't be moving around and he's still trying to help me get my bikes going and do this and he just wants his hands and everything and just do whatever he can for anyone. And that's who he is. It's just that's, part of who he is. That yeah. is just who he is. He's an amazing and pretty cool dad. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's not do that. <laughs> Did you know that kidneys are the master chemists of the body? Normally, there are two of them. One on either side of the spine, under the lower ribs. They are reddish brown in color and shaped like kidney beans. Each kidney is about the size of your clenched fist. About this. The main job of the kidneys is to remove waste from the blood and return clean blood back to the body. Every one minute, about one liter of blood enters the kidneys through the renal arteries. After the blood is cleaned, it flows back towards the heart through the renal veins. Usually, the kidneys are able to provide more than twice as much kidney function as your body needs to work properly. Also, a normal kidney can greatly increase its workload. So, if one kidney is lost, the kidney tissue that is left can work harder in order to keep your body healthy. There are some ways to prevent or slow down the progression of kidney disease. Many people with CKD find that a wellness approach improves their ability to stay fit and maintain a good quality of life. Some facts that help achieve wellness include a well-balanced diet, regular physical activity, good blood pressure control, good glucose control if you have diabetes, stop smoking, manage anemia, weight control, taking medications, and limiting your daily alcohol intake to one or two drinks. And now you know. We met with Dr. Copeland recently to talk about kidney disease and on particular dialysis, including the different types of dialysis and what this can mean for kidney patients. So kidney disease has no cure, but dialysis is a treatment that helps uh, do some of the things that healthy kidneys do. Can you tell us a little bit more about what dialysis does? So you're absolutely right. Kidney disease doesn't necessarily have a cure, but there are lots of things that we can do to treat kidney disease. For people whose kidney function has declined um, to the point where um, it's not enough to keep them well, that's where we start to think about using treatments like dialysis. So dialysis isn't a therapy to fix the kidney. Mm -hmm. Dialysis is a therapy, actually what we term it now is kidney replacement therapy. So it's there to actually replace the work that the kidney's not able to do anymore. So that involves removing fluids, balancing the salts and the electrolytes, removing poisons from the body and, and doing the things that the kidney is actually doing quietly in the background. As a sort of a general principle, when people are down into the six, seven, eight percent range of kidney function is when we would usually start dialysis, even if they weren't having any of those symptoms. So we would usually start to, to consider using mm -hmm. dialysis at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually quite remarkable how low people can actually can get with their kidney before function before they we actually need to need start to go using. On. Yeah, that's, yeah, that is interesting. And I understand that there are different types of dialysis, I guess primarily two main types. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit on those those two types of dialysis and I guess secondly 
how do we determine what type of dialysis a patient would need? Okay. Yep. So you're right. There's two main groups or two main camps. One is what we call peritoneal dialysis right. and one is what we call hemodialysis. Mm -hmm. So peritoneal dialysis is one where we would put a tube into the tummy just below the belly button mm -hmm. and then we would put fluid into the space in the, in the abdomen and it would sit there and it would slosh around and it would actually remove the toxins and remove water and do a, um, do the therapy that we're looking at there. Um, the other one uh, is called hemodialysis and hemodialysis is where we would typically create a shunt in the arm where we would take an artery and a vein and put them together and then we put needles in and we'd run that and we'd take the blood out and we'd run it right. through a machine and we'd clean it through an artificial kidney. And I think when most people think about hemodialysis, if they think about hemodialysis or mm -hmm. think about dialysis, they think about hemodialysis. Right. But actually in British Columbia about a third of the people are doing perineal dialysis and you know, there's there's benefits and there's problems with both of them. Right. Um, and so the choice of which type of a therapy you go on is largely going to be a patient-driven decision. And I understand you're, you're, you're a bit of a leader in the home hemodialysis That's field. That's how I spend some of my day, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's involved in home hemodialysis? Yeah, and it's, and it's a really good point because actually when I'm sitting in an office with my patient, I actually don't start by saying there's peritoneal dialysis and there's hemodialysis. I actually start by saying, where do you want to do your dialysis? Ah, um, and I start talking to them about doing it at home, doing it in a hospital, right. doing it in a clinic. We do have another option in British Columbia where we can do home hemodialysis, where we actually take somebody, we teach them how to put in those needles. Right. Hard to believe, but people actually are really can, good at putting in their own needles. Right. Right. Um, and how to operate the machine. Uh, and so they actually learn how to set up the machine, mm -hmm. how to uh, respond to alarms that come up on the machine, how to take themselves off to do some basic maintenance on the machine. Um, so, so people don't necessarily have to be thinking, I have to go to dialysis and I'll do it in the hospital or in the community unit or something like that. Right. There are options to, to look at getting them to be able to do it at home as well. And what about side effects from dialysis? Are they, do they feel more fatigued? It's common to be quite fatigued, especially after a dialysis treatment, right. especially early on when we're first starting with the dialysis treatments and the house is really messy, then um, you know there's there's some work to be done there and, and people are often quite tired. Yeah. Um, so it's not uncommon for people at the end of their runs to, to go home and have a sleep mm -hmm. um, or to be feeling pretty tired for the day. Um, sometimes, you know, the dialysis treatment itself doesn't have any pain or discomfort associated with it other than needling. Right. Um, but there are things that can come up. Sometimes people's blood pressure drops during dialysis run. Sometimes people feel nauseated or they have some headaches on dialysis. Um, so there are things that uh, that uh, can come up during the dialysis treatments. But I would say actually probably the biggest thing that I hear people complaining about is after the dialysis when they're quite fatigued. Are there any things that they can do to, I guess, help lead a better life or live well? on dialysis? I, mean, I know you mentioned earlier exercise. Are there any other things you might counsel your patients on in terms of leading a good life while, on, while on they dialysis. are on dialysis? The motherhood statements are, are absolutely there. You know, living an active lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, as active as they're able to, is very important from a global health point of view. Right. You know, dialysis is associated with some of the dietary changes that we've talked about. And so if people are able to uh, help control their sodium intake, their potassium intake, their mm -hmm. fluid intake, that's all beneficial. And that's a, that's a tough job actually, mm -hmm. um, just in and of itself. I can imagine. Um, yeah. so, so if they can sort of focus on doing that, I think yeah. that's a huge help to us um, uh, as the care providers because it makes our job easier, which in turn makes their job easier. There are a lot of different medications um, and pill burden and the number of medications can be a bit overwhelming for people but it's worth talking with uh, with the care team about you know which ones are the most important ones which ones right. you know to, right. to have a look at right. what you're right. taking yeah. as long as they're able to help us by taking those pills on a regular basis which again is a challenge um, does make things better. Well, we are out of time, and uh, that's it today for Ask the Expert, and I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Copeland, for, for joining us. No problem. My pleasure. Today, I am honored to have some of the Kidney Kids crew in the studio with me. Welcome, everyone. Hi. Hi. So great to meet all of you. Thanks so much uh, for being here. Uh, first off, could you please share your name and what is your age? Hi, I'm Nicole and I'm 10 years old. Welcome. Hi, I'm Charlie and I'm 7 years old. Hello. 
Hi, I'm Elena, and I'm 10 years old. Welcome. Hi, I'm Laura, and I'm 12 years old. And hello. Thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I know things must be a little bit hectic now that school's back in session. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I actually like it. Yeah, yeah, right? I love good. school. Uh, excellent. I'm wondering if each of you could mm -hmm. share a little bit about your experiences. Uh, perhaps, Nicole, uh, what is a highlight for you? My first performance with the Kinley Kids was at the Shine a Light Gala. We performed in front of hundreds of people. Hundreds? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, how was it when you stepped out on stage and there was so many people in front of you? Well, it was quite nervous, but it was fun. After that, I was interviewed by Dr. Gill and Dr. Levin. Some people don't know this, but kidney disease does not just affect adults, it affects kids of all ages. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us, Nicole. Anytime. Now, Elena, I've been hearing some excellent things about the Penticton Peach Festival. You and the Kidney Kids crew were up there recently? Yes. Excellent. Well, uh, you guys were dancing and handing out candy during the parade. Uh, what was the most fun thing about it for you? The dancing part. Awesome. I wish I was a better dancer, so bravo for being a part of it. Thank you so much for telling us about the Penticton Peach Festival, Elena. You're welcome. Thank you. Now, Lauren, uh, what is a special moment of the Kidney Kids crew that has stuck out for you? Well, the one that stood out for me was in June with the Kidney Kids and Cops. It was really special because the cops came from like all over BC Excellent. and it was really cool because dozens of them came mm -hmm. to sign up to be organ donors and they, they were there to show their support and spirit to kids all over BC. Love it. Great role models and it's great to have the boys in blue supporting the Kidney Foundation Blue. So thank you. And finally, last but not least, Charlie, uh, what has been a fun moment of the Kidney Kids crew for yourself? Well, I like going to visit my sister Helena at Kidney Camp. This summer, we have got to go over to the camp to perform. Awesome. Uh, what, what did you guys perform? The fight song. You know, it sounds like you guys have been having such a great time all around BC, the Yukon, being a part of the Kidney Kids crew. I know I'm a little bit older, but is there anything that I can do to help? Well, you could perform with us. Mm-hmm. But, but first, we need to teach you some moves. M moves like, <laughs> like dance. Dance, dance moves? With, yes. <laughs> we can do this. Whoa. Okay. Uh, so the first steps are wiggle your hips. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. If, if I'm going to be wiggling my hips, I think I'm going to need some backup. Uh, Manfred, Lori, come join me here for this amazing Kidney Kids Crew dance lesson. Okay, well, first steps again. Wiggle your hips, it really working. Okay. Okay, working it, working it. Again, wiggle your hips. Love it. Okay, nice. cool. Uh, what else and is there? Then, oh, yeah. One. Yeah. Two, three, four. Okay. It's like, it's like riding a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nice. And now we do four fist pumps. Okay. Really get it in there. Three, four. Awesome. And Thank then you. you do. I don't, don't really care if nobody else believes. Nice. Because I, I still, still got, got a lot of fun left, left in me. me. Awesome. Woo! Great job, Kitty. up next to tell you about all the exciting events happening in your community calendar. Back to you, Kayla. I'm Kayla Wallace reporting for Community Calendar on Plugged In. On Saturday, February 4th, the Kidney Foundation of Canada, BC and Yukon branch is hosting a special event. We're inviting anyone with both diabetes and kidney disease to participate. The event will be downtown Vancouver from 10 a.m. until 12 noon. Dr. Melanie Brown, nephrologist, will speak, as will an individual living with both diabetes and kidney disease. 
It will be a chance for participants to tell their story if they want and to seek support and encouragement from others trying to manage both conditions. The nephrologist will be on hand to answer any questions. The event is free, but please register in advance. Please contact Heather Johnson at the BC and Yukon branch for more information. Looking for that perfect Christmas gift? We've got it for you! Tickets are now on sale for our annual kidney gala. On Thursday, March 9th, the Fairmont Hotel is where you'll want to be. Join members of the business and philanthropic communities, medical professionals, their patients, and supporters in celebration of the people and possibilities within BC's renal community. This elegant gala will feature a cocktail reception, sit-down dinner, entertainment, and a fabulous silent and live auction. Tickets are $250 per person. Visit kidneygala.com to reserve yours. Are you looking for a peer support group about kidney disease and live in the Lower Mainland? The Kidney Disease Support Meetup may be for you. To join the group, check out the link below. The 7,000 volunteers across British Columbia and the Yukon are the backbone of our organization and without their dedicated support we could not fulfill the mission of the Kidney Foundation which is to help improve the lives of persons living with kidney disease. So, if you would like to volunteer with the BC and Yukon branch, please call us or send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Kayla Wallace, reporting for Community Calendar. I'll see you next time on Plugged In. And that wraps it up for another edition of Plugged In. I want to thank all of our guests who joined us today to help make it an informative and fun show. Um, as always, we want to thank all of you for joining us today on Plugged In. And don't forget, we want to hear from you. So let us know what you thought of today's episode on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like, share, and spread the word. And email us at pluggedin at kidney.bc.ca. All right, please uh, don't forget to take a minute and register as an organ donor. It's super easy. You just go to the website, kidney.bc.ca, and click on the red button that says register. Just do it. It's really important. You'll save lives. So, also, I want to thank our sponsor, Kidney Car. So, we'll see you next time on Plugged, Plugged In. in. Steve. Oh, Steve. Oh, Steve. Oh, Steve. Steve! Make the call. Donate your vehicle to Kidney so Car. Okay. The dish ran away with the spoon. Two plus two is four. The color is blue. I don't know how to read. Oh, man. I'm not going to pay this. Hey, it's me! <laughs> oh, come back! <laughs> I'm Blanche. Blanche Dubois. In today's segment of Ask the Expert, no. <laughs> what? Ask, <laughs> ask, 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 sorry? Yeah, that's really the urban. Leave the mic on there. We don't ask the expert. <laughs>